Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the virtual house of the Lord. It's another day God has given us. Thank you for being here. Heaven's Gate, we're saying back to church our morning worship service. We're excited about what God has revealed in us on this week and want to share with you. We all took time this morning to log in or share or pray with us on this week. We thank God for you. We want to jump right in and, and open up with our prayer and give you direct shelter. And we'll come back to you with any announcements and move into the word. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and holy Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Father. We adore you and we love you today, Father God. We come to you today, Father God, as a church congregation asking you to lift us up, Father God. We're asking for your blessings today, this day, Father God, as we go about doing your work today, uplifting your kingdom today, Father God. We ask you to be with Minister Black today as he brings us your word and your message to us today. And we ask that our hearts be open and our minds are free that we can receive everything that is, is put forth today, Father God. Father God, as we stand before you, Father God, we ask you to go by every hospital today and heal. We know you said by thy stripes, we are healed, Father God. And we ask you to go touch everyone today, Father God, for we need a blessing in this country this day, Father God. Father God, as we travel about our highways and byways, our roads, our streets, our avenues, our alleys, Father God, we ask you to go forth, be that light, guide us, Father, keep our feet on the right path, Father God. As we run across any adversities in our life today, Father God, we ask you to be there first, to guide our tongue, Father God, to watch our eyes, Father God, to keep our hands to ourselves, Father God. We ask you to bless us and hold us, keep us steadfast. Yes, Lord. Father God, as we go on about our business today, we ask you to go by the children's home, Father God, and bless every child in that home, Father God, who's yearning for a parent, who needs us, Father God. Father God, though we did not we did not birth some of these children, Father God, we could be a father, we could be a mother, we could be an uncle, we could be a brother, Father God, we could be a mentor to just those children, Father God, who need us, Father. We ask you to be with every parent today, Father God. Give them direction as they try to direct their children, Father God. As we live in a climate, Father God, where we say we're Christians, but we live totally out of that Christian life. Amen. Father God, we ask you to bring us back. Bring us whole, Father God. Father God, you said if we, we come to you early, that once we're older, we will not depart, Father God. Well, here we are standing with you, Father God, asking you to guide us, lead us, Teach us how to be a mentor, how to go out into this world. Teach us how to bring in other fishermen, Father God, because we should be fishermen of men and not just fishermen of fish. If we teach a man how to fish, he could eat every day, Father God. So just teach us. Just guide us, Father God. We ask for your light to shine in our life, Father God. Let us be a light, a lantern for you. Get us out of our own way, Father God, for we know that's our biggest problem is that we get in our own way. Yes, sir. And we know, Father God, is by your word that we should live. And Father God, we also ask you to touch every mother, Father God. Yes, our mothers are very strong. They have been the backbone of our families for the beginning, Father God. So help lift them up, Father God. And I ask a special prayer for my sister Janice. Thank you. All right. Bless him. Father God, y'all just don't know what me and Janice have been through together. Bless him. She's not only been my sister. Bless him. Even when I wasn't worthy, she was there for me. She's always been more than a sister to me. So, Father God, she's in Florida. And you know the climate in that state. Come on. Come on. Be with her, my nieces, my nephew. Be with them. Stand with them, Father, and hold them. It's not easy, Father God, me being this far away from my family, but. I know our parents raised us yes. to be with you, Father. 
And no matter how far away we are, we're always together. No matter what adversity we go through, yes. we're always together. So Father God, I ask a special prayer for just my family. And yes, I'm being selfish today, Father God, because my family needs you. From my oldest aunt, who's in her 90s, to the baby who's just born, uh, keep us strong. And Father God, now I ask you to go to my children. It's Reese and Ebony, Father, and Donovan. Why are they scattered all over this country, Father God? They're grown now. And I'm not there. So we need you, Father God, to just stand with me. And Father God, here at Heaven's Gate, we stepped out on faith. Because you said, step out. And Father God, Minister Black is here. He's been a friend of mine from day one. And not only is he my friend, he's my brother. And not only is he my brother, he's my spiritual guidance. Though I'm older, he's the pastor. And we stand together. And with the families at Heaven's Gate that's going through, Father God, we know you're carrying them and we only see one set of footprints. Yes, sir. And we ask you, Father God, to keep lifting us up, hold us strong. And to my wife, who is still struggling with things because of the death of her niece, hold her, keep it next to your bosom, Father God, and give me the strength. Give me the strength, Father, to hold her and be there for her, Father. And if anyone is going through anything, if I left anyone out, charge it to the head, not the heart. Boy, we love you. And in the name of Jesus, I pray. Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank God for your obedience this morning. You can show us for all of you who pray. We were touching the real on that prayer, that heartfelt prayer on this morning. Um, from the heart of Deacon Shelton, we lift him up as well. We pray for us to God be in his household, be in his mind, be in his heart, be in his body, be there with his people. Is ahead of God, we ask him to be in the church. And thank God for your servitude on this morning. We are excited to be here in this moment in time to bring forth the word we believe to be from the Lord. We're thankful for God having you here. We know each of you have had your own trials and tribulations during this week. And there are other things that we could be doing, but you chose to spend a few moments with us, and we're grateful for that. Uh, just from a business standpoint, other than being here and being thankful, we're thankful uh -huh. for the website that was published on this week. We thank God for that. Feel free to visit the website, leave your email, leave your prayer requests, so that on Friday we can come together incessantly and pray for you, whether you can make it or not. And also bringing back the Nehemiah Bible study on this Thursday night. Um, due to the different time zones, I am believing that spot seven o'clock central standard time is the best time it's a little late maybe for the east coast at the 8 p.m for them that'll be 5 p.m for the west coast and 6 p.m for mountain standard time but i believe seven o'clock would be the best time so you'll get more information on that you want to jump back into the i don't want to leave that because i just let us be preaching on sunday morning so here we are we are grateful we are here and we are thankful for the word that is before us feel free Oh, let me turn my volume up. I'm being told you can barely hear me. So let me turn my volume up. Thank you for that. Thank you for using the chat. Hopefully you can hear me a little bit better now. I'll cut this down. Let me know if you can hear me a little bit better now. Amen. Amen. Talk to me via the chat. We want to make sure that you can hear us. I'll turn the settings up. There we go. All right. How is that? Hope somebody let me know in the chat if that's better, if you can hear me better now. Let me know. All right. Okay, I can hear. Amen. Okay. As we move forward, we'll just like I said, we're on Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook Live this morning, I don't have that screen up, but feel free to use that comment section as well so that you can uh, we can pray for you, whatever issues there may be. We want to jump into the word this morning. We ask everyone to mute their microphones. However, if the Lord hits your spirit to say amen, unmute and say amen, and let's worship together on this morning. Uh, for I see the shelters are speaking to each other via the chat. Bless their souls. So we were saying on Thursday nights, we'll get back into the Nehemiah worship. Uh, are you ready to work? You'll get more information on that. 
the website has gone forth. And I know there's been several of you that have, want, have reached out to me personally about how to give and how to be a blessing to the ministry and to be obedient in your tithes and offering. If you have joined, uh, have considered yourself joining with us, I will defer all those financial questions to Deacon Shelton. He does have a busy week, but I feel, as the Bible says, it's my responsibility to just deal with the word, and I allow Deacon Shelton to reach out and talk about any financial interest or what we are doing as an entity to put aside those funds and use them for the blessing of the ministry. So he'll be able to put his email in the chat so you can reach out to him and he'll correspond with you about any type of giving, uh, and I will keep my hands off of that because we want to definitely keep this uh, spiritual on my side, financial on his. So to God be the glory for that. So let's move forward in the word this morning. We're excited about what God has shown us. I tried to prep you a little bit this week and give you some little breadcrumbs of what we were going to be speaking about. We're coming out of the book of Genesis. For those Bible scholars, you know that Genesis is the first book of the Old Testament. For those that have never cracked the Bible in your life, Genesis is still the first book of the Old Testament. So either way, Genesis is the beginning of it all. That's where we find the Eden account. That's where we find the account with the information about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A lot of the beginning stories, or not stories, but biblical truth you'll find in the book of Genesis is in a great launching point into your biblical studies to see how God orchestrated this whole thing, how he set things up, and how he's prepared us to not only live, but to live victoriously. So if you have your Bibles with you today, we ask you to jump into Genesis chapter seven, chapter 19, beginning at verse 17. Genesis chapter 19, beginning at verse 17. Definitely want to utilize that and be prepared to read that. Genesis verse chapter 19, beginning at verse 17. I'll read that in the hearing. I'll cut the speaker off. And uh, we're still working on our technology here, but we're going to cut that off. So now Genesis 19, beginning at verse 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. This text is speaking to Lot and his family. And Lot said unto them in verse 18, O oh, not so, my Lord. In verse 19, it says, Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Verse 20 tells us, Behold, now this city is near to flee unto thee, and it is a little one. O oh, let me escape thither, is it not a little one, and my soul shall live. This is Lot speaking back to the representative, the angel of the Lord. And in 21, he says, and said unto him, see, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. Also that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Verse 23 tells us the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Verse 24, 25, and 26 starts, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, I want you to hold on to that, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that which grew upon the ground. And our verse of focus here today as we do the whole contextual study, we really want you to hold on to this verse 26. But his wife, Look back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Today, for a few brief moments here in worship, we want to speak from the subject, do you see what God sees? Do you see what God sees? Father God, we thank you. We love you, Lord. We are so happy, Lord, that you are being a blessing to us, Lord, and that you've kept us through this week, Lord. We're asking you, God, to speak through me this, Lord, uh, this morning, Lord. And that you'll allow us, God, to teach this word, Lord, and allow others to learn, God, about seeing and tapping into the vision that you have for our life. We're going to talk about Lot. We're going to talk about his children. We're going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. But we're also going to talk about what she did at the end there, Lord, that showed us a picture of if she really was in tune with what you had for her life and for the life of her family. Let us learn from this scripture text, Lord. Let us jump uh, and, and to learning more. Let us, let us start our, our, our beginning here, Lord, and just be hungry for more word from you. We thank you for this word, Lord. We lift you up for all those that are listening, God. Allow them to chat and comment to say amen and to encourage me, God, as I continue to be obedient to you. Teach us through this question, Lord. Do we see what you see for our lives and for our walk and for our journey through this, 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 this land that we live in until we see you face to face? Do we see what you see? We love you, God. We thank you. Amen and amen. Do you see what God sees? 
I had the privilege of spending some time with my brothers this, this week. Earlier this week, I was in Atlanta for a training. And on Wednesday and Thursday, I had a chance to spend time with two of my brothers. I am the eldest of, the, of the, all the siblings. There's seven, six boys and a girl. Uh, however, my brothers right up under me, uh, we're, they live in Florida. We went to a graduation in San Antonio, Texas. Now, San Antonio, Texas is a lovely city. It was my first time visiting. They have the Air Force Academy there where my niece was graduating from her basic training. They have what's called a hemisphere, which is similar to the Space Needle that we have in Seattle. They have a, a lot of wide open spaces, some affordable housing. They have the Alamo, which people know about. Uh, San Antonio doesn't have a Waffle House, though, so that kind of ruined my whole trip. But needless to say, while they're in San Antonio, spending time with my brothers and enjoying that fellowship and enjoying that bond, I was able to speak with my niece, who was able to graduate from basic training. She had left Tampa. She had forged on to San Antonio. It was a little challenging for her. My, my brother, which is her father, was concerned about her journey. He was concerned about if she could tap into the vision he had for her life. He was concerned about whether the walk that he had walked and he knew what he had done in life and the things that had kept him from what he felt God had for him. And the last thing my brother wanted was for her to follow that same path. He wanted her to hold on. He wanted her to realize that God has something for you greater than Tampa, Florida. God has something for you that's greater than the job that you're carrying right now. However, you have to want to do it. You have to move forward. And ultimately, my brother was saying in a, in a non-spiritual but yet a spiritual way, I need you to see what God sees. I need you to understand that where you are is not where you're supposed to be. And there's an ordained path for your life. And we got to witness that this week. And there's some points and some lessons we're going to pull for that because of his love for his daughter, similar to God's love for us. God wants us to see what he sees for our lives. In the book of Genesis, we find Lot's family. We find a situation here where Lot is the nephew of Abraham. We know the great patriarch, Abraham, who was the father of many nations. Lot was the one that Abraham said, come on and go with me, even though the directions were only for Lot to go, to, I mean, Abraham to go to a promised land, which God had shown him. But because of Abraham's uh, a passion for his nephew, because of his love for his nephew, he said, you and yours come and go with me as well. As we set the foundation for this text today, they're sojourning and they're out in this wilderness area, but God is yet providing. And it comes a time when Lot's men, because Lot had a lot of money, he was, he was rich, he had uh, people working for him, and the servants of Abraham, they could not get along. This blessed land, this promised land, this situation, it could not get to the point where they could convene together. They could not commune. They couldn't work hand in hand. They couldn't hold hands and, and, and work circumspectly before the Lord. So there had to be a division. Lot, because of his desire for, for, for worldly things, because of his desire of not godly things, even though he was raised in Abraham's house, he chose the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in choosing this land, Lot knew that Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom itself being the name where sodomy comes from, a sin against the Lord, a sin against mankind, this is still the area that he wanted to live in. This is still the vision he had for his own life. This is still where he wanted to raise his children. Even though he knew the things that were happening in this land, Lot chose what he saw instead of what God saw for him. And that brings us to the text today of what went down in Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened in this land that he chose. You do know that you can choose a place that God doesn't have for you. You can choose an employment because the dollar amount looks good, but that's not the ordained place for your life. You can choose a spouse because of how they look and what they, what, what they, uh, well, things that they do and what they have, but that not be the spouse that God has for you. This is when you're operating off your own vision and not the vision that God has for your life. A lot of us have made that mistake. We jump into a, a precarious situation, and then we want to look back and invite God into the hell that we've created. Well, Lot is in a really hellacious situation here. The people have come to, to, to take the men of the city is evil there. He's been there for a while. He chose his life. Now let's dive into the scriptures and see if Lot and his family can truly see what God sees for them. In verse 17, it says, and it came to pass when these angels that had come upon Lot's door, when they're talking to him, they give him instructions because they already know that God has commanded and God has demanded that they, they burn down this entire city. Sodom and Gomorrah has been so sinful. Come on, earth. Come on, United States. Come on, uh, Egypt. Come on, Europe. Come on, all these other countries. They've gotten so far away from the word of God that now God is he's commanding them to destroy the entire city, to destroy them because they're separate from me. They're not following my commandments. They don't yearn after me. They don't love me. They don't know about me. So I am going to destroy this entire area because it's so evil. Yet I'm giving you an opportunity. Yet I'm giving you a chance to leave. So my instructions are in verse 17. He says, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. These are very straightforward terms. 
This is when you get your bag packed, make sure you leave. Where after you go pay all your bills, make sure you get up out of here. I'm telling you to escape. So as I'm reading this text church this morning, I'm saying, well, if this is where you live, why do you have to escape? Escape is a word that has a negative connotation. Escape is a word that makes it seem as if you're almost in prison there. Escape is a term that makes it feel like you're actually somewhere, not by choice, but by, by, by being, being held down, being strapped down, and there's something better for you. Why does Lot have to escape from the place that he calls home? That brings us to our first point as we ask ourselves this morning, do we see what God sees for us? Some of us, all of us, Brother Black included, from Deacon Shelton, my wife, my mother-in-law, we have been incarcerated by our past scenarios. Point number one, you have been incarcerated by your past scenarios. For Black, what does that mean? Incarceration. Incarceration is when you, are, you have been confined. You have been told that you're in a prison sentence. And a lot of times we equate that to a, 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 a solitary confinement or a jail cell somewhere or a federal compound. We do know that you can have incarceration of the mind. And your past scenario will tell you, you can't be free from this. You're always going to be Calvin. They used to call me Calvin at Rocket Point. You're never going to equate to Kevin. You're always going to be the little sister. You're never going to equate to be the grown woman. You're always going to be this. You're always going to have a record based upon crimes. Imani, you're always going to be Tampa's daughter. You're never going to be anything outside of this. Why would you want to leave? But the word of God is saying, escape from this lifestyle. Escape from this situation. Truth be told, this is not what I meant for you anyway. You chose to be here. You chose it by the way it looked and by what it presented into you. But that's not what I had for you. So I'm giving you an opportunity to escape from where you find yourself to a place that I have for you. I'm giving you the way of escape. I'm bridging your past and your present. I'm bridging your present to your future, but you need to leave and you need to leave now. If the truth is really told, a lot of us are in some situations that God has already given us the direction to leave, but we're incarcerated. We're held down. We're bound up by our past scenario. We too pay a part to Christian folks on how we incarcerate others. A lot of us love to cry you know, guilt and love to cry, oh, woe is me, because this situation is holding us down. A lot of us have been the, the wardens in the prisons of somebody else's life. A lot of us walk the halls with our dimmy stick and our keys, and we, we've got people locked up in cells because of what we think about them, what we've said about them, how we treat them, how we don't love them, how we talk about them, how we never give them a chance because of who they used to be, because of what they did in the past, how they moved in the past, what was said about the past. We are not giving them an opportunity of freedom because we're incarcerating them to their past scenario. We need to learn that God has, given, God has given us a way to escape. God has given us a way to get out of these situations. God has, through the blood of Jesus Christ, allowed us to say, you can leave and you can leave now. You don't have to remain there. You don't have to always live there. But we are holding on to what the past has presented us. When we go to our job interviews and the resume that when you work here, you see this, we see this. And a lot of times we won't get a position in man's eye based upon who we were, what we used to do, and lack of experience in a certain area. But when we're dealing with God, God can wipe your slate clean and present you and put you in places that favor will only take you and none of the rest of the stuff matters. But you have to be willing to go. You have to release and you have to get rid of the incarceration, this jail cell of a mindset that is holding you down in a past scenario. That's why God, they're telling him in verse 17, these aren't just kind words, Lot. Get your stuff, get your family, get your people and get up out of here. And I'm telling you to do it and I'm telling you to do it now because you don't know what's on the way. I'm telling you, God has sent me here to not just make problems in this city. I came to demolish this city, but because of the love God has for you, I'm giving you a way of escape. Some of us are stuck in our past jail cells and God has provided the key. He's, he's provided not only parole, but he's going to wipe the slate clean and we choose to sit in that same spot. We're incarcerated by our past scenario. My brother told Imani when we were there this week, he said, I wanted you to leave Tampa because I know in Tampa there may be some good things, but there's also some connections that would bring you down. He said, I wanted you to leave the things that pulled me down when I was a younger man. I wanted you to leave the environment that was not good for me and has me in the state that I'm in today. I may have my life, but there's so much that I've missed, and I don't want that for you. God is telling us the very same thing. I've got a location that you may not know, but I'm, I'm encouraging you, and I'm asking you and begging you to believe and trust in me so I can release you from this jail cell and take you to the freedom that I, my son died on the cross for you to have. How many of the truth really be told in the chat today in your personal lives have looking at your personal situation and God has been nudging you and God has been poking you and said, 
You're not living the liberty life that I have for you, the one I died for. You're living the incarcerated life because you choose to stay in your past scenario. That's point number one. You're incarcerated. We're incarcerated. And freedom is right beyond the line. But we won't take the step because our scenario is fooling us. Our scenario has become comfortable and we are not prepared to grow. After realizing that you're bound, that's part of that. You have to realize it. You have to understand this is not my norm. Well, Brother Black, how, 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 how do I know what my norm is? How do I know what is there for me? How do I know what the next step is? That's when you tap into God's word and look at the promises and you stand on the foundational truths. But you'll never know what's out there for you if you never investigate what God has for you. If you're never cracking the book from Genesis to Revelation, you think the life that you're living is the norm. You think the suffering that you're going through is the norm. You think that the, the resources don't you have that you don't have is the norm. That is a trick of the enemy, and that is a trick of your current and your past scenarios. Stop. Get your freedom today. Let go and let God and move where He's telling you to move, but you have to be willing to let go of your past scenario. It's my prayer this morning that we're not incarcerated. And if we are, through the word and through this scripture, that we know God has provided a way for us. And in this text, also, He's not just providing a way because He's ready to get you out, He's providing a way because that past is getting ready to be torn and burned down. And He does not want you to continue to live there when the demise falls upon that situation. Look at verse 18. Amen. Now, now, now we, amen. We're, 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 amen. We're reading this and we're seeing this and we're thinking, oh my God, look at what God is doing. God has already saved your life. He's provided a way of escape. He's, he's came into your negative, nasty situation. And he's saying, look, I'm ready to take you up out of here. I'm, I, I, get up out of here and get up out of here now. This is clear direction. But let's look at what Lot says. In verse 18, Lot said unto them, oh, not so, my Lord. Now, when we read this text, the first thing we scratch our head is that Lot must be crazy. He's living in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's negative over there. These very same men, these evil men, not the ones blessing, but the evil men the night before was trying to sleep with the other men. And Lot, it was so bad that Lot had to offer his own daughter so they went to sleep with the men of God. It's harm all around. It's evil all around. And the good God from heaven has come and offered me a way out. And I'm saying no. Now, it's easy to judge Lot when we look at this text, but I guarantee a lot of us have told God no to his face in our very own life. Come on here, bro, Black. I want you to move over here and I want you to do this. I know you're comfortable there, but let's go over here. Well, God, I'd rather stay here because I make more money. God, I'd rather stay here because I'm more comfortable. God, I'd rather stay here because this is where my cousins, this is where we all grew up and I'm comfortable here. God, I'd rather stay here because it looks crazy if I go with you because I don't know what's on the other side. Those may be different words, church, but all you're doing is the very same thing that Lot is doing. You're telling God no. You're telling God, no, that don't make no sense, God. I know you're the God of heaven. I know you created everything. I know you spun the world in existence. But in this situation, God, I think I know better than you. I think I know what's best for me because of my comfort and where I'm at right now, the things that have been awarded to me. I think I make sense, God, and you're talking crazy. So I'm going to tell you no, but I'm going to say it in a way that doesn't seem so bad. Some of us have that audacity in our daily life. We tell God no because we like where we currently are. We tell God no because we don't trust, even though every day of our lives, he's continued to prove himself, provide manna from heaven. Uh, he's given us food on our tables. Every bill has been met. Maybe not the time you want to be met, but everything has been taken care of. But yet we continue to pull up our church collar and put on our dress clothes and we tell God no. How dare you tell the God of the universe no, he don't know what he's talking about when he can see further than you can see. This is evident in the life of the Christian that you're not seeing what God sees. This is evident in the life of the Christian that your vision is not tapped in to trusting and believing that God has an ordained path for your life. Brother Black, I've been in church for 35 years. That's the only place you've been is in church because you have not been in God. Because if you were in God, you would trust and you say, God, I know it don't make earthly sense, but you're a heavenly God. And if you say this is where we're going to go, I can't pack fast enough. That's the problem in people today because our fear keeps us incarcerated. And I'm praying that we'll learn from Lot today as we watch Lot make these questions. And, and it, it, it's, it's almost secular and almost funny in a way when Lot looks at God and he talks back to these men of God and says, no, I ain't trying to go there. It's almost like God's like, what you mean? What, 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 how, what you gonna, how you going to tell me you're not going to go and I'm the one that's been keeping you? As we laugh at Lot this morning and his in ridiculous statements, find the closest mirror and ask myself, is God asking me what you mean? Is God asking me, how dare you say these things? A lot of us have a lot characteristic, but yet we just got it, got it under a different name. Some of us are in a Sodom and Gomorrah, but yet it's called a different place. 
It might be called Louisville. It might be called New York. It might be called Delta Airlines. It could be called something different, but yet it is still a Sodom and Gomorrah place that God is trying to deliver you from. But because of our comfort level and because of our incarceration, we don't accept what the Lord has for us. In 19, he says, behold, now that servant has found grace in that sight. Now, a lot does something here that we like to do at times when we want to bring up to God's remembrance the goodness that we've done. Let me brag on myself. You know, you, you, now, now, look, I don't really want to go where you're telling me to go because you, I found grace in that sight. You've magnified me with mercy. You've shown me saving of my life. There's all these accolades that the Lord has done, but yet I still can't go. I can't be obedient to what you told me to do. If I'm God, which I'm not, how dare you tell me how good I've been in your life and then tell me you can't be obedient to what I tell you to do? That makes no sense. I've been good to you. I fed you. I gave you what you didn't have. I got you out of bad situations. I directed you whenever you were in need and you didn't know where it was coming from. I'm the one that provided. But now you're going to have the nerve, the gall, and the audacity to tell me what you're not going to do. This is the calamity in the church today when you've been saved for so long and you know a few scriptures. You get into the situation where you feel like you can tell God what's best for you. That, 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 is, that is the dangerous place for a Christian to be when you've gotten so saved that you know more than God. I have directed you. I have never failed you. But yet you have the unmitigated gall to tell me what you're not going to do. And I'm giving you fair warning. God doesn't have to do that. He could have destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But what Lot fails to realize is his uncle Abraham had been praying for him three or four chapters ago that he wouldn't die, that he wouldn't uh, be left in that situation. Somebody is praying for us and we're too foolish to realize that the grace and mercy that God is giving us is because somebody else has got a prayer on the shelf for us. Children, when they do dumb things and they, they, they run out in places they shouldn't be, back to my brother. My brother been playing for my, praying for my niece since the day she was conceived. And she don't realize those prayers God has been honoring and he's been listening to to get her to the place that she's at. And that's a long walk for us. Some of us are old and still got to have people praying for us because we're being disobedient in our old ways. And God is saying, you're trying to tell me you're not going to go where I sent you. You're not going to be obedient. And listen to Lot. Listen to what Lot does here. He says in verse 20, that city is near, uh, that, uh, near. it's a little city. Don't send me there. Send me here. Come on, Black, what do we do? God gives us a plan for our lives. And God tells us what we ought to do. And the first thing we start doing is we get into negotiations with God. We start counteracting. Well, God, don't do this. Let's do this. Well, God, how about this instead of that? Instead of full obedience and autonomy to given to God, we want to make concessions about what we will do if God will do this. God, if you consider this instead of that, then I'll move in this direction. If you consider this instead of that, then I'll be obedient to that. That is, that, that is I, I don't know where the mindset comes from that you can have these type of bargaining sessions with the Lord. We've gotten so comfortable in treating God as our friend, which he is our friend, but we've gotten away from understanding that he is also our master. And these suggestions that he's giving us really don't have to be suggestions. They can just be direction and commands. And we've taken these things and we've gotten out of control. We, we do it, but we do it in a way that we don't realize how disrespectful that is to the Lord. When our children, when we tell our children, I'll bring my daughter into it. I hope, you know, she's listening this morning. She's, she's excellent. She, she, she plays sports. She, she runs all over that field. She has a busy day. She goes to homework club. She does all these things. Her calendar is full. She got more stuff on her calendar than a CEO of a, five, a, a Fortune 500 company. She's always got some things that's going to better her and is going to put her in situations that she shall be blessed. But when her day is done and we know she's tired, hey, let's go ahead and settle down. Let's go ahead and get your shower. Let's get your pajamas. It's time to go to bed. She wants to alternate to something else. And then she makes me feel guilty. And I love her, I really do, because she puts me in a spot. I say, hey, let's go ahead and go, go to bed. Mom said, let's go to bed. Hey, can we do Bible study? Now, how am I going to say no to Bible study? And the have that said, are you really want to do Bible study? You're just trying to stay up a little bit longer. But she puts me in a situation where I have to show some grace and mercy, because how often is a child asking for that? But is that the real reason why you brought this up? Because that Bible study book has been there all day long. But it's the time you bring it up, because you're wanting to do something different than what you've been directed to do. We laugh at that, but some of us are doing the very same thing. We do it in our everyday conversation with God. And I'm going to be honest, it's strictly called disobedience. It's disobedience. And when there's disobedience in place, you're delaying the great things that God has for you. You're delaying the, the fortuitous thing that God is going to do for you. You're delaying the benefits and that press down, shaking together that we love to talk about, that overflow situation. You're delaying it because God has it in store. He knows the location, but because of you making some alternate situations and suggestions, you stay in a, a despair situation longer than you're really supposed to. 
So then we get mad and we blame God. Why am I still here? You're still here because you chose to remain there and you're still incarcerated in your past scenario. So Lot offers another city to him. Look at 21. And he says, and he says look, I, 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 I've accepted, I've accepted he concerned this thing. The angels responded and said, I'm not going to overthrow the city that you talk about. You can go there instead. Here we go. Here we go with more grace and mercy. Something that God does not have to offer, but he does it because of his love for us and his love for his children. But a lot of us don't take grace and mercy and allow it to be a correctional tool. A lot of us take grace and mercy and we allow it to handicap us. Like you got to explain that. Well, if I can just push this a little further, then I can do this. I know God's going to look out for me so I can just sin one more time because he's forgiven me and my, my sins have been paid for. That is when you're taking, you're, you're abusing the salvation, the privileges, and the forgiveness that has been given unto you. And let me tell you something, when you start abusing that, it makes you ask the question, am I really saved? But black that hurt, I told you, I've been in church all my life. But when you start abusing the goodness that God's given you, you have to ask, are you really loving God? Or are you really only thinking about self? I don't want to go there. I want to go here. And here God allows the angels of the Lord to continue to bless and show grace and mercy and said, okay, you ain't got to go over there a lot, but guess what? You got to get up out of here. You got to leave here now. And, and, and in your, and as we go further in the text, you're going to see if you would have learned to listen to me and stop making all these alternate itineraries and follow the path that I put before you, your destination of for, uh, fortune and, 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 and blessing and overflow, you would have reached it a whole lot sooner. But because you want to linger in places that aren't good for you, you've had to play this waiting game. And the waiting is what sucks. That moment when you don't know when the sun going to rise, where you've chosen to make your night longer. I've been ready to bring the sun in your life, but you've chosen to, to linger longer than where you should have. Imani learned that through it. Now she's so excited. She's graduated. She's got her uniform on. She's got her rank. She's moving around. She's getting her money from her paycheck. But these are things that her dad wanted for her a long time ago. But she had to linger. And she had to bump her head, as the old people say, and, and knock her head up against the wall several times until she finally realized, he has a better vision for me. And if I'll tap into that, I can receive what's really out there for me versus the things that I'm trying to scramble and receive for myself. Verse 22. Now he goes out of 21 and says, and I, I missed this point. I want to bring this point to you. As he's suggesting this other city and he's saying, I want to go here instead, we've already learned that in point one, you've been incarcerated by your past scenarios. But in point number two, not only that, you've become intoxicated with your present situation incarcerated, past scenario, don't want to leave. This is comfortable. This is where I want to be. Present situation, not really where God wants you, but you move one step further. Now you become drunk with that because you're in a situation. I make a little money. I got my promotion. I got a nice house. I got the best ride. You know what I'm saying? I got this wife. I got this husband now. We done got married. We making babies. I have made it. And now God says, hey, come on. I got somebody else. I want. I got some other place I want to take. What you mean, God? The, the, the drink from this time frame feels good to me. I'm not where I was. I finally left Sodom and Gomorrah. I got somewhere that I'm feeling comfortable. And you trying to move me somewhere else? Why, why won't this gospel locomotive just be still? I'm good. You may be good, but are you really being used by God to bless somebody else? And are you really good if you're out of God's will? See, what will happen in society is we'll get a few things and we think that we've made it. We'll get a few things and we think, okay, this is it. This is the, this is the, 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 the cream of the crop. My bills are paid and God is good. This is what it's all about. But is that really what it's all about? When God has a spiritual order and a spiritual command that we're supposed to be following, things that we're supposed to do, we are blessed to be a blessing, as Deacon Shell just put in the chat. This We are be given these things to bless somebody else, but we're intoxicated. We've been made drunk by our current situation. Intoxication is a strong word, Brother Black. We're talking about Christians here. We're talking, I, I deal with it every day. Every day when I go to work, I, at least five to seven people have sat at the local bar in their present situation inside the airport. And then when it's time, thank you, Jesus, when it's time to move into the aircraft and go to their final destination, they can't go. Why? Because they're intoxicated. Because they've allowed the moment to overtake them. And now their mindset and their mobility is not where it needs to be. And now you're going to miss your flight. And not only miss your flight, I'm going to deny your travel. Because now, because of your intoxication, the people that are ready to go, thank you, Jesus, the people that have accepted, this is where I need to be. This is the gate. This is my ticket. This is the order of instructions that I need to follow to get to my final destination. They're going to go, and guess what? You're going to be left behind because you chose to get intoxicated in your present situation. 
I've been incarcerated in my past. Now I'm intoxicated in my present. And Imani realized, he said, my daddy wanted me to leave Tampa and that was my past, but Tampa was feeling good to me. I had my job, I had a car, I had my friends, I had my boo thing. I had everything right there in Tampa, Florida. I didn't see I, nothing that I needed outside of Tampa's wall. And a lot of us are myopic about that because the situation, our present situation, we don't see what God has for us outside of our present day wall. We have become drunk. I'm not gonna use this big word. We're gonna become drunk with our current situation. Sipping on the present and missing out on the future because when that flight takes off, you're unable to board. We think about those points today and we think about Lot because he doesn't want to leave. He's choosing other places that he wants to go. And the angel says again in verse 22, I told you to hurry up and escape. But now I'm telling you, since we've told this other place, hurry up and get up out of um, Sodom and Gomorrah. You, boy, you're not listening to me. Get what belongs to you. Get your family, the ones that you love, because there is a negative thing that is about to go down. If you remember in uh, Noah, when he built the ark. And remember when the land was dry again, God made a promise through the form of the rainbow. And he said, never will I destroy the earth by uh, water next time. He said, it'll be by fire next time. He said, I'm not going to use the promise. Every time you look at the rainbow, you can remember the promise that I made to you. I'm not going to destroy the earth by a flood, but the next time it'll be by fire, it'll be by brimstone, and the whole earth itself will be cast into the lake of fire, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. What is he destroying in Sodom and Gomorrah right now? The evil in that land, fire and brimstone. God is keeping his word. He said, I told you what I was going to do, and this is what's getting ready to happen, but you are intoxicated and drunk in your current situation. Ask yourself today, am I sipping on the present and missing out on my future? Ask yourself, today, are you sitting at the bar of your present day life, getting drink after drink, thinking things are well, having conversations, meeting people, talking to people, and thinking all is well, and missing out on the future destination because you don't know how to get up off the bar of everyday life. The, the drinks that the devil is serving you taste the best. The pleasures that the devil is serving you feel the best. The situations that the devil is giving you, they, they make you just feel, they give you a euphoric feeling in your body, mind, and soul. And you think this is what is for you when God is scoffing at you because he's trying to take you to another location. Do you see what God sees? You don't. Because the past has told you you'll never be anything and your present has told you you're enough. And God says, I got more. But if you got to be willing to come with me, look at 23, 22. He's saying, we're still in chapter 19 for those that came in late. Genesis 19, 22. He says, hurry up, haste thee, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor. Now, wait a minute. Now, we're talking about the, 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 the man, the angels that work for the Lord. What kind of situation, Sister Tamika, is it that he can't do anything? How do we have God's uh, agents, how do we have their hands bind here that they can't do anything until a lot leaves? And I'm looking at that. I said, well, you, God, you sent them. God, you told them they had to go. God, you're going to destroy this, the Sodom and Gomorrah because of the evil of the land. God, you're protecting them. But why is it they can't destroy the city until uh, Lot leaves? Once again, we go back to the prayers of Abraham. And God keeps his word. Abraham went back and forth. That's where Lot got this stuff from. Back and forth, parting with the Lord. Hey, if there's 10 in the city, will you save it? If there's 20 in the city, will you save it? If there's this man in the city, because he was thinking about his nephew Lot. So God made a promise to Abraham in the chapter right before this one. If there's 10 in the city, I promise you out there are holy and righteous. I won't destroy it. But the moment they're not there, I'm tearing that place down. So here we find the fulfilling of that promise. We can't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah until you get your family and get up out of here. Because God made a promise to Abraham, the man that was praying for you. So God is bound by his word. Uh, now come on, Paul. Paul, you're going to Rome. When Paul was on his way to Rome, the ship broke down. There was hurricanes. There was uh, tidal waves. Everything that could have happened between his destination and between his starting point. But when Paul got to Rome, he got there hanging on to one piece of wood. And God said, and he knew, if God tells me I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to get there. Your path may not look like Sister Leah's path. Your path may not look like Granny's path. Your path may not look like Brother Roy's path, but your path is ordained by God and how you get there is up to how God directs you and your obedience to the path that he placed in front of you. But I want to go this way, Brother Black. I want to go the way Sister Jermu went. I want to go the way Sister Janice goes. You might not get directed to go that way. You go the way God tells you, but the end result is all that matters. The struggle is going to be there. When they talk about lifting weights, the more muscle, I mean, the more weight you put, the more muscle you gain. When they talk about uh, losing weight when running and stuff, the more miles you run, the better you shape or uh, form up your body. But your path is going to be different than the person next to you. And we get caught up in being jealous of what somebody else is doing or how they got theirs first, thinking that God doesn't have enough. 
Trust the path that God has laid before you. Trust his word. Journey on that. Walk that and watch and see what happens. But you have to do what? You have to see what God sees. And if you're blinded to it because of your past or because of your intoxication, you'll never have your eyes clearly open to what thus saith the Lord. 23, he says, look, uh, 22, he says, look, we can't do that until you get, you leave there. And then he says, when he, therefore, the name of the city was called Zor, and the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zor. Now, ch now check this. You got to catch the time change here. And I hope you have your Bibles open because you can really see it better and understand it better by looking at it. It says, Lot entered into Zoar. That's the end of 23. Then look at verse 24. The first word is what? Then. Then is a time word. Then means it happened after the obedience, after Lot went into Zoar. That means that God's word is true. Nothing happened to Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot had exited the city. If that ain't God's protection, I don't know what is. Even Lot in his idiotic ways and his selfish ways and his foolish ways, God still put protection and grace and mercy over him. Some of us are walking foolish every day. Every day of our life, doing stupid stuff, making bad decisions. But the grace of God, like I said, it's, it's handicapped some of us, but the grace and mercy of God falls upon us in our situations every day because God is sitting back shaking his head said, I have told them to leave. I've told them to move and they're holding on. I don't know why, but because I have a plan for Kevin's life, I'm going to let him meander for just a little while longer. And then we're going to move him where he's supposed to be. When Kevin realizes and he taps into the vision I have for him life, then he'll be willing to go instead of sitting in that laborious situation. Some of us say we're tired. And I would ask yourself, are you really? Because if you're really tired of the same old thing, you would do something different. A fool says you keep, you, you, you keep doing the same thing, but you expect a different result. That, that makes no sense. That's asinine. If you keep doing the same thing, how can you expect a different result? You have to do something different. So you got to ask yourself, I'm praying today, Sister Sharon, that you'll ask yourself some way and not just you specifically, but you, you know, just using your name. I pray that we sit in a situation and we look around and then we say, am I doing what thus saith the Lord? Am I being obedient? Because when you truly answer that question, there'll be no question about why you're sitting in the same place. You're sitting there because of your disobedience and you're reluctant to do what thus saith the Lord. So it says, then, look at verse 24. Then the Lord rained, what? Upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire. From who? From the Lord out of heaven. People always ask the question, well, well, well why did God destroy the ant? Because he destroyed the sin that was in the land. And those that partake of the sin, amen, those that partake of the sin are going to be part of that demise and that destruction. So ask yourself, we're in this world, but are we of this world? The Bible tells us clearly to be in the world, but not of it, to think on heavenly things. So if we're in this world and we're participating, we're getting our hands dirty with all this sinful stuff, when the destruction falls upon this earth, guess who's going to be a part of that? You too. But we go back to our resume, Brother Black. We go back to I'm a deacon. We go back to I'm a reverend. We go back to I'm a first lady. We go back to I'm an usher. I'm a mother in the church. But if you're of this world and you're participating in worldly, fleshly desires and sinful things, then when destruction falls upon this Sodom and Gomorrah, you're going to be a part of it too. And that's a travesty to spend your whole life thinking that you say. That's a travesty spending your whole life thinking that your works are going to do something for you. That's a travesty when you have done nothing but fooled yourself because you're incarcerated by your past and you're intoxicated by your present. So it says, then the Lord, the Lord did this. This ain't come from the devil. A lot of times we go and blame the devil for everything. The Lord is the one that rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm doing this because you don't, you're not obeying me. I'm doing this because you're not following my commandments. I'm doing this because I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired of telling you the same old thing every day and you refuse to listen. So this ain't come from no outside sources. This came from me. I did this to you. I'm doing this to your situation to either make you uncomfortable and get you up out of there or to bring it to an end. The Bible speaks about being turned over to a reprobate mind. Unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of us, and I hope not the ones on this panel, but there's going to be a lot of people that are going to keep on sinning and keep on sinning that they won't even be able to be saved. It's going to come a point where God is going to block their mind, block their, and he said, you know what? The window of opportunity has been closed. It was open. My son hung that cross, and for 2,000 years later, uh, evangelism and preaching went forth, and you chose not to accept it. So I'm closing the window. You're going to be turned over to a reprobate mind to where you can't give your life to Christ. Why would we wait for that? Why would it have to get to that situation when there's people, not just myself, there's teachers, there's preachers, there's laypersons, there's evangelists, there's people preaching the word of God every day. And the opportunity is there every moment of every day to give your life to Christ. And we're so incarcerated, we're so intoxicated, we don't want to move forward. That moment is going to end up, don't let it fall on you. 
So it says God through this, and it says, and he overthrew those cities in verse 25, and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city that which grew upon the ground. When God wipes something out, he wipes it out totally and completely. It, it's not going to be any remnant left of it. It's not going to be an opportunity for it to grow from anything to grow from that. I'm wiping the whole slate clean. Come on, Noah. When he flooded the earth, he flooded the earth of all living things and all those that did not believe of him. He, he kept a remnant of two people or two animals of each kind and so that they can go on for, uh, and, and have that, that food tree for later in life. But he wiped the slate clean because of his upsetness and his anger against sin. Same things coming to the, to the earth we live in today, this Sodom and Gomorrah we live in today, if we do not choose God as our Savior and trust his plan and his path for our life. Look at verse 26. It says, but his wife. Now, but is a negative conjunction. We've always taught this. If you've been in any teachings before, we see what happens in 25. We see how Lot is begging for another place to go. We see how Lot has been incarcerated by his past and he's intoxicated by his present, but yet God still blessed him and got him out of the city. But let's look at his family. It says, but his wife, she looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. But his wife, Lot was raised under Abraham, so we know that he saw a godly man. Lot had daughters, he had children, but yet we see Lot making bad decisions. And now we see his wife. Where did she make the decision from? She looked back from behind him. That lets me know that she wasn't walking with him. They were, she wasn't walking in unison with her husband. They weren't moving in holy matrimony together to the place that God told them to be. She's lingering behind him. What did verse 17 says from the first start of this? It says, escape for thy life and look not behind thee. What's the first thing Lot's wife does? She looks behind her. You ask yourself this question, why is she looking behind herself for a black? Why is she longing into a place? Because she's still incarcerated by the past. She's still intoxicated by her present. But our third and final point, she's also ignorant of her future uh, significance. She doesn't realize what God has for her. And we talk about lots like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she looked back. She looked back because that's where her desires were. She looked back because Sodom and Gomorrah is where things were important to her. She looked back because she wasn't, she didn't understand how significant she could have been in the future. So she, the thing she was longing for, that's what she looked back to. And because of her disobedience in this situation, she has now been turned into a pillar of salt. And you know the bad thing? Salt is actually a good uh, a mineral because it preserves. Catch that. I want you to hold on that. We're going to teach on that in a minute. Salt preserves. If you rub salt uh, in the country, they would take a piece of meat and they would rub salt on it. It would keep the, it would keep the meat even when there was no refrigerator. It would keep the meat even when there's no issues, when there was no place you can keep the stuff cool. That salt would preserve it. We eat salt of the earth. The Bible says that. So we can preserve people and keep them. She became a whole pillar of salt, but there was no one she could preserve because she was longing to remain in a location that wasn't for her. Do you see what God sees? No, she didn't see it. Because if she would have known later in this chapter, later in this text, and I pray you'll read it later, Lot ended up sleeping with his own daughter. Lot went to the cave in this very same city that he had to go to. So it all circle, it all makes sense when you put it all together. This very same cave that Lot wanted to go to, not where God directed him, but where he wanted to go to. His daughters were over there. He done lost his wife. He done lost the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And all the choices that Lot has made have not worked out. What you would think, well, Brother Black, he saved his two daughters. Yeah, but he also lost two daughters and their husbands because they chose not to leave the city. Lot has, Lot has lost a lot of things based upon his decisions and because he didn't see things the way God saw for him. So now we have this situation where his wife is a pillar of salt. She was looking back, longing for something that wasn't for her, longing for a place that God didn't want her to be, longing for the past when God was trying to move her to a future, longing for sin when God's trying to bring her to salvation, longing for that, that, for that old, the ex when God has got you in a present situation, longing for money that meant for the love of money is the root of all evil, longing for situations that aren't good for you. You're looking back when God's trying to take you forward. So it's evident that you don't see things the way God sees them. So when we look at this, how Black, how could she have been significant? How did she miss out on the, the ignorance of her future significance? Because if the mama would have been there in the cave, then Lot would have been sleeping with her and not messing with his daughters. You're missing out on the opportunity. She could have saved her children from incest. Black, it goes deeper than that. The Moabites and the Ammonites that were born from this ancestral relationship, those people don't even exist today. They've been wiped out because they were born from an ancestral sinful relationship that was created because of lots of disobedience 
and for his wife's longing to be where God didn't want them to be. Your every action, every reaction, everything we do, it causes things down the line. There can be blessings that you miss out on, but there can be curses that you run into because of your disobedience, your incarceration, your intoxication, and your ignorance of the word of God. We talk about Lot's wife, but over in, in, in Luke, Jesus spoke about it again. It says, remember Lot's wife. When he spoke about the situation of heaven and what's to come, he said, he's telling us, don't be like her. Don't look back. Take up that cross and follow me. How can you follow Christ if you're steady looking back? I don't know what it is today that we're holding on to. I don't know that what we've got our grasp into. I don't know, and like, like Amani, when she finally realized at graduation, this was the best decision she ever made in her life. The decision was always good. It just took her a while to get there. God has spoken to each one of you, whether it be individually in your soul or through the spiritual leader of your house about what it is that he wants you to do. And if you're lingering, it's nobody's fault but your own. If you're lingering out of fear, then there's no God in that situation. If you're lingering out of lack of faith, then that shows there's no God in that situation. And what do I need to do, Brother Black, to gain no fear and to gain faith? Because it's tough out here in these streets. Dive into the word. Look at Lot's story. Look at Abraham's story. Look at the story of Christ. And I say story, but look at the biblical truths of how God moved in their life. And remember, the same God that did it for them is willing to do it for you. You cannot live in the past. Those days are gone. They're gone. They're, 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 all they did was they, there was a moment in time that helped create who you are today, but you, you're beyond that. And if you're living there or you're intoxicated by your presence, then you're missing out on the future and you truly don't see what God sees. My goal today is to preach to you and to teach, and teach to myself about moving forward and being faithful in the Lord. I speak from this lesson because I've had to live this lesson. I've sat in situations and environments and places that weren't for me because I got comfortable. And I missed out on a lot of good life because of my disobedience and being in those places. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for this church body. I don't want that for the world as a whole. But if we look at this text, and I pray you'll read it later, and I pray that you, you'll get more from it than I was able to give you today, ask yourself some honest questions. Have I truly moved on from my past situation? Am I really enjoying my present situation too much that I'm not hearing from God? And am I ignorant about the future and my significance in the future that he has for me? He told Jeremiah, I knew you since you was in your mother's womb, and I've ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. If he knew Jeremiah, guess what? Sister Janice, he knew you. Sister Kendra, he knew you. Lady Leah, he knew you. The same ordination and the same call that he put on Jeremiah's life, he's got one on your life. But what do you do? How do you move forward? How do you get to that point? I'll say it again because I really want these points to resonate home with you. Let go of your past. Pull away from the bar of intoxicated presence and become, don't stop being ignorant about your significance in the future. You're looking back and you can turn to a pillar of salt and be good for no one and set your family and your future up for demise. I pray that none of you do that today. I love you. It is my prayer today. If someone wants to put in the chat, we'll read the chat later. I pray that you receive something from this. We want to be honorable at the time. God, thank you for this word, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to preach to all that are on Facebook Live or on the Zoom channel, Lord. It is my prayer, Lord, that we'll, uh, we'll just look at our own situation, God, and really be truthful about where we are, how we're moving, whether we're being obedient or not. And when we answer those questions, God, truthfully, before thy face, Lord, then we'll understand where you're trying to take us. God, change our vision, Lord. Our vision is set upon the things that we want and what we see and where we want to be. But God, let our vision be in tune with where you would have us and where you would take us. That's our goal for today, Lord. It don't take a long time to express that. That's my heart. And I pray that that be the people's heart as well. Dive into this word. Go ahead and finish reading. Read what happens in the mountain, in that cave, where Lot's daughters get him drunk and they have sex with him, where the daughter is sleeping with the dad. And he's like, oh my gosh. Ain't no sense in being offended. Because a lot of us are being incestuous and we're, we're, we're having relations with things we shouldn't be having relationships with. We're, we're laying down with some demons and things that we shouldn't be laying down with. We laugh at life, but our, what are we doing? What, what, who are we laid up with? What cave are we in? And who's in the room with us because of our disobedience to the Lord? Stop being incarcerated by your past. Stop being intoxicated with your present. And stop missing out and being ignorant of your future significance for the Lord. That is my prayer. I love you all. If there's anyone that desires to be saved, please let us know. I think Deacon Sheldon put his email in the chat. Please feel free to let us know. Reach out to us. Use the website. Use the email um, interest form. 
we want to reach out to you. We want to pray for you. Uh, we are we are not going to hold you long. We thank you for the time you gave us. Uh, the doors of the virtual church are open. We want you to become a member of God's body. That's our biggest thing. Whether you ever uh, have a membership role to Heaven's Gate, that's all right. But be a part of God's body and allow him to take you through the times and the days and the locations that he has for you because he's got a plan for your life. I promise you, but you have to believe it. You have to tap into it. We have to be obedient to the will and the way of the Lord. That is all I have. Be blessed on today. Thursday night, we'll be together in um, study of Nehemiah. Be blessed today. Take this word with you and, and bless somebody else. We, Lee and Lady, Lady Lee and I are so glad that you were here this morning. Please invite somebody for next week. Bring them back. Let's teach them. Let's teach them together. And let's love them, somebody says, as we move from our past to our present to our very significant future. You can Sheldon, I see you unmuted. I don't know if there's anything you want to say before we close. I see you unmuted. So I just thank everybody for being out here with you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say, if you do want to make donations or pay tithes through Heaven's Gate Missionary Baptist, you can at our Chase Bank through our Zill account. And that will be my number, 425-691-6441. And if you have any prayer requests or anything that you'd like me and the pastor to talk to you about or whatever, email gmssr43 at yahoo.com. Amen. Amen. We love you all. Be blessed. We just pray a prayer of safety today and take God with you where you go. Until next time, we'll see you Thursday night. Be blessed and be a blessing. Amen.